Hey, and welcome to Middle Farm Studios. This is the studio where we recorded the modern and massive drum sample library. And today we're here to look at a mix of a short track that I've done using that sample library. And we're gonna be going through it step by step and looking at all sorts of different techniques that I use for mixing songs in general, as well as how I use modern and massive and how I think you can get the most out of it. The track that we're gonna be looking at today is a short kind of alternative commercial rock song that we've written. And our good friend Robin Adams put down some amazing vocals on there as well. So we're gonna be looking at this track, it's called For Today, and looking at every aspect of the mix. So as you can see in the session, I've got here an instance of Modern and Massive up and running. And this is the exact setup that I use to create the audio files that I'm gonna use within the mix of the track. Um, so you can see here it's the default Q-Drum Co kit, and I'm also using the VK Copper snare drum, which is the last one on the drop-down menu there. Um, I've got it set up so that we can actually monitor what the dry sound out of Modern and Massive was that I used to, the, that I bounced through to audio. And I'm not using any of the turbo functionality or anything like that, I'm just using the raw sound. So I've got um, the kick drum. So let's just take a listen to these raw sounds in the context of an actual beat. Uh, this is what it would sound like. And we're gonna to aim to end up with an actual drum sound once mixed that sounds more like this. Cool, so perhaps the best place for us to start would actually be at the master bus, which might be a little bit counterintuitive. So the way that I approach mixing is to use what's called a top-down approach, which is actually do some processing across the master channel or through a bus that's very far down the uh, through the recording signal chain that then kind of retroactively applies some EQ moves across everything that's running through it. So it's a little bit like getting a little bit of the mastering process done um, while you're mixing and actually before you dive into listening to any of the individual tracks. Um, the EQ I think is one of the most important things that I apply here and, and here I'm, I'm using this uh, Slate Digital Virtual Mix Rack with a couple of instances of two different EQs. So I'm using the Neve style EQ to give a bit of a top end lift. So this is it's kind of like a 5k-ish uh, boost of about 2, 2 dB. I'm also boosting a bit of low end as well and I'm also high passing here about 35 Hertz. So those on their own are gonna give me a little bit more bite and presence out of my mix as well as a bit more low end. And then I'm using this custom series EQ to give quite a healthy amount of boost. Uh, I guess it's like four and a half dB at 12K. And this is a really nice silky sounding top end boost. To me, this is the kind of stuff that you just tend to get when you send tracks off for mastering. Um, so it's really, for me, it makes a lot of sense just to do it at this stage and to always be listening to my sounds running through this. I also have put a little bit of a 60 hertz bump in on here. That's a bit of a more recent thing I've been doing just to generate a little bit more low end, but it's not necessary. And then finally, I'm using a bit of a trim because the next thing that comes in the uh, signal chain is a compressor. So here I'm using another Slate Digital plugin. This is the FG Grey, which is based on a famous SSL style bus compressor. Um, and the way that I set this is a little bit different to what a lot of people do. A lot of people use their bus compression to get a little bit of extra uh, smack out of the sounds that are running through it, like a little bit of extra attack. I kind of do the opposite. I use a very fast attack and release time. Here I'm using a 0.3 millisecond attack and the fastest release, a four to one ratio. And what this does essentially is it just clamps down every time there's a snare hit. Uh, the idea here is that you can get the snare to cut through really loud above the rest of the instruments but it's actually being controlled in level by this, uh, by this compression here so that it doesn't end up kind of jabbing you in the eardrums, which tends to be what happens if you have to mix a snare really loud on top of the rest of the music. So this is a pretty crucial part of my, uh, my mix. I also like very much that this compressor has a high pass filter function, which doesn't affect the actual audio that you hear, but it affects the audio that the compressor is reacting to. And what you can do with that is prevent the kick from setting off too much compression because if you've got a loud, bass-heavy kick drum, you're gonna get so much compression on that, it's gonna make the whole mix pump way too much for my liking. So by filtering off that low end at this stage, I'm able to focus the compression more onto the snare. Uh, I'll just show you actually how much this is doing. I'll, I'll play the, the entire mix through the, uh, through the instrumental bus so that you can just see how much gain reduction you're getting. I typically aim for about three or four dB on the snare hits and about 
just about 1 dB on kick. It depends. Sometimes I want a bit more kick pump for effect and I might actually set the high pass filter accordingly a bit lower down so that you actually get a lot more of that kick pumping effect. And then other mixers, especially some clients don't want to hear any of that and I might push the high pass filter way up so that there's literally nothing happening when the kick hits. It's just getting triggered by the snare. So um, here we go, it's a little excerpt for you to hear and see. If I were to play that exact same thing but without this, in fact I'll start without and then I'll, I'll put it on and you'll hear the difference. You should notice the snare suddenly gets very blocky sounding without it and it gets uh, way too loud on top of the mix. So the really important thing here is because all of the instrumental channels are going through this, um, they're all getting affected by the compressor. So although the compressor is taking 4 dB off the snare, I'm, I'm saying, it's actually taking 4 dB off everything. So the relative relationship with the snare to the rest of your mix is kept constant. And that's a really crucial part because otherwise you, there'd be no point in doing this at all. You just mix the snare drum quieter. So essentially we're, we're able to maintain a greater separation of snare drum to the music, but without there being a huge dynamic spike every time. So, you know, that kind of rounds out my top-down mixing. I do, however, um, over here on the actual master bus, have an instance of the Slate Digital Tape Machine, um, which I use set to the half-track mode, and apart from that, pretty much just straight up. And this adds a nice bit of extra low-end girth. Um, again, some clients don't want to hear that, um, but typically I'd say 99% of clients that I work with are totally cool with that being on there, and. When I send my tracks off for mastering, I leave it on there too and never had any complaints. It's quite a subtle change. It's nothing that's really distorting the mix. Um, and then finally, this is something that I would remove if I was gonna send it off for mastering. This is an instance of FabFilter's excellent Pro-L limiter, which I'm using um, to get my mix up to a kind of commercial-ish volume, perhaps a little bit less than, than what you get from a Pro Master. But this does two things. One, it means that when clients hear what I do, it doesn't sound way softer in volume. But also there's a certain effect you get when you limit and clip your mix where you reduce the, the transient impact again. The snare drum will sound very pokey after the, the treatment that I put it through and the limiting or clipping that gets applied during the master stage tames that down and ends up with a nice fat snare sound. So for me to be able to judge that right so that when I can send my mix off to mastering and know that I'm gonna get something back that sounds good, it's really helpful for me to mix through this kind of limiting or clipping um, on the master bus the whole time so I can make all of my decisions based around that. To dive into the way that I set the mixer in Modern and Massive in order to be able to get the sounds that I want out and into audio, um, let's take a look. I'm doing things, I'm, I'm kind of creating an idealized setup really uh, that you couldn't get in real life because what I'm able to do in this program is adjust the relative levels of the various instruments into the room tracks. Now when you record live drums you're kind of stuck with cymbals and snare and kick and toms all at their actual levels and cymbals tend to really dominate in room mics a lot of the time and if you want to compress them you end up with loads of extra cymbal in your mix which I don't isn't really the best thing. However what you can do in the virtual domain such as with Modern Massive is actually control the amount of cymbals that goes into your room track so um, you'll see over here I'm actually not putting any cymbal into the room far microphone so the room far microphone is going to be essentially just shells um, and especially the further you get away from a drum kit when you record it, the more the cymbals tend to carry and you lose the beef off the actual shells. So that's why it's super cool to, to, to use that specific technique on the room far microphone where the shells need all the help they can get. Then I have the room close set. So you've kind of got about, I don't know, I guess you've got a few dB less cymbals than you would normally have. And I'm kind of just comparing the fader here, um, which is set pretty much the same on, on snare. Uh, and toms, and then you can see the symbols have been pulled down a lot. The snare, um, I've, I've trimmed down the snare bottom mic a little bit because I typically don't use very much of that in the mix. Um, something interesting is I've decided just to roll with a single pair of overheads when we recorded Modern and Massive, actually in the room that's right next to me at this moment. We used uh, two pairs of overhead microphones, so we did a pair of large diaphragm condensers and a pair of small diaphragm condensers, which are kind of a much more hi-fi, brilliant sound. 
And I've decided just to roll with the small diaphragm condenser sound for this mix. And I've basically muted the large diaphragm condenser channel on, on all of the uh, on all of the instruments of the kick, toms, cymbals, none of them have the uh, large diaphragm condenser in there. And they're all bounced through at unity level. So you're getting the kind of as recorded relative volumes of those kit pieces coming through the overheads. Um, and then I've just kind of trimmed the, um, like the spot mics on the hats and ride and the, the tom close mics to be something that's usable, gives me loads of gain to work with through in the mix stage. And once I've gone through and exported all of that out, what you end up with is these blue pieces of audio here. So you've got, I've got my kick channel and I summed the kick in and kick sub together uh, for the purposes of this mix. Then you've got the snare top and bottom separated, essentially from there on out, every, every channel separated. So you've got your toms separate, hats ride, overheads, room mono, room close and room far. You could, if you want to get really fancy and for example, bounce, just shells on each of the room tracks and just cymbals on each of the room tracks to be able to have control after the fact of um, of the relative levels of those instruments there instead of having to kind of preset them within the mixer and then print them through to audio. And just to chat for a second about why you would even want to print to audio instead of simply running the MIDI, it's for a few reasons. I think, you know, for example, archival, you want to always be able to reopen a session and have the sounds there and you never know if something gets messed up in your system. It's much better to have it as pure audio there than programs. Um, other reasons could be, I think a big one for me is just mindset. I think when I'm mixing, I don't want to be making what I'd call engineering decisions. When you have the ability of opening up a virtual instrument and being able to try, you know, flick through all the snare drums again or adjust all the levels within there, I feel like sometimes you get a bit further away from the process of actually making what you've already got sound good. So I like it just as a kind of exercise for my own sanity to print things down into audio in order to just work with exactly what I've got in the mix as though these drums have been recorded perhaps even by a client and sent to me instead of it being something which I did myself. 